Well, hello there, good people of the internet, and welcome back to another episode of Quantitative Bytes. So I thought I'd try out a slightly different format for our video today. Instead of going for the sort of standard sitting in front of the computer thing, I'm going for a slightly more devlog style uh, format for this video and the next, probably the next couple of episodes at least. And if I feel that it works well, then I think it's something that I'll continue to do for future videos as well. But we'll just have, we'll see how it goes. The reason for the change of format is that what I want to do over the next couple of episodes is something really slightly different. So previously when I've done the tutorials, the fairly long form tutorials that you'll have seen before if you've been following my channel or if you're subscribed, I would do all of the work beforehand, uh, develop all of the code, say for example with the ray tracing tutorial, I wrote the whole ray tracer first and then I broke that down into separate episodes and then went over each um, separate piece, divided it into 12 sections, or one for each episode, and then went over uh, the code for each episode respectively. And I think for the making of long tutorials or long form tutorials, that is a good way of doing things. However, it, it's con I'm kind of aware that it's not the only way of doing stuff. And what I want to do, at least for the, this uh, video and maybe the next two or three is something more devlog, um, centered. So the particular problem that I'm looking at solving, um, you know, is that I've been using the SDL2 library with C++ in order to render graphics, to draw graphics to the screen. As you'll know, if you've been following along my previous videos, particularly in the, the fractal, uh, fractals in C++ series. And that's very good. SDL is a very good, really basic cross-platform library for, for doing very simple Windows stuff. So it allows you to create a window on the screen, it allows you to do simple rendering into that. It has all sorts of other functionality for handling user input and all of that kind of thing, which is not something that I've needed to consider um, so far. So really what we've been using it for is just to create a window and then draw our fractal shapes like the Von Koch curve or the Dragon curve in the previous episode into that window. And it's quite good for that, but I have begun to get a little bit frustrated that the 2D drawing capabilities that it supports are very limited. It's fine if you want to draw points, if you want to draw lines, or if you want to draw simple rectangles, it's okay. But if you want to draw anything else, well, okay, you have to write the code for that yourself. And particularly, I had an interest in being able to draw thicker lines. I'd like to be able to specify a line thickness greater than just one pixel. And that is not something that is natively supported by the SDL2 library. So what I've set out to do is to create my own uh, library for drawing two-dimensional primitives with the SDL library, which is what this, this series is then going to be about. And as I say, unlike the previous tutorials that I've done, I am in the process of developing this library now. I haven't written it all beforehand. And so this isn't intended to be so much of, of a tutorial that you can follow. It's really, I just want to chart my progress of writing this library for myself. And I hope it will be a value um, to at least some people out there in terms of if you're trying to solve this problem for yourself or if you have a need for the, being able to draw two-dimensional primitives using SDL or SFML, in fact, I mean, the basic ideas would be applicable, I think, across a number of different platforms. So if you find yourself in that position, then I, I hope um, these, these next few videos, this video and the next few videos will be of value to you in terms of inspiration and, and seeing how I have gone about solving this problem. I'm not necessarily claiming that the way I'm doing things is the, the best way or necessarily the most optimum way. But what I want to show is my process for going through doing something like this, building this kind of solution uh, to a problem that I have, how I write code to solve a particular problem. And I'm hoping, as I say, that something of value, uh, that there will be something of value to you guys uh, from that. This is not going to be a sort of keystroke for keystroke long form tutorial like the videos that I've done before. I'm going to show you all the code um, that I have. Uh, so, of course, you're welcome to pause the video at any time and type the code in yourself, that's fine. Um, or just look at it and take away what messages you need from that or what inspiration you need from that for how to go about this doing this kind of thing. And then go off and write your own code um, if you need to solve this problem yourself. In fact, I think that would be my recommended approach, really. So 
the, the best way to use these videos is to watch them and learn what you need to from them and then go off and try and solve the problem yourself rather than necessarily following everything I'm doing uh, keystroke for keystroke. I've set out to create a basic uh, simple 2D primitives library that works with SDL and the basic features that I want this to have are as shown here. And really what I'm looking for is an object oriented library that allows me to create instances of classes that represent certain shapes. And in particular, I want to be able to vary the parameters of objects that I've created after I've created them. So the point of this is to try to abstract away um, as, much of as much as possible of the, the actual drawing um, uh, infrastructure, if you like, to, 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 to actually create the shapes on, on the screen in the window. Ultimately, I'm kind of thinking it would be nice to be able to support animation. So, for example, I want to be able to create an instance of a circle class, and I want that to be rendered into the window um, as I create it, but then I want to be able to vary its parameters, such as its position, its radius, or its color, um, and I want to be able to animate that. I don't want to have to create a new circle every time. So the way SDL kind of works for this sort of thing, if you, if you were to do that in a very simple way, you, you would simply draw a new circle um, every single time you would be creating. The way to do that would really be to create a function that draws a circle into the renderer and, and then simply call that function every frame. So every time you loop through your, uh, your main loop in your, um, in your code, you, you would simply call that function to draw a new circle every time. I don't want to do it that way. I want to be able to create an instance of a circle class that will then exist, and then every frame, all I need to do, if I need to move that circle somewhere else or something, I just need to vary its parameters. I don't want to have to worry about drawing it again, resetting its color and its position and its radius every time if all I want to do is make it move along the screen horizontally, for example. And so the code structure that I've settled upon, you can see in this uh, diagram here uh, to my right. And what I want to do is to create a base class, which is going to be called object. And all of the different objects that I want to be able to draw are going to inherit from this base class. So there are, as I've identified so far, three sort of basic um, uh, primitives that I want to be able to draw. And these are circles, lines, we can do lines in SDL2 already, but I want to be able to draw lines and specify their thickness in a number of pixels. So, so I'm going to create my own class for that. And the final one really is a filled polygon, uh, which can have n number of vertices and then automatically filled. And then special cases of the filled polygon that I've identified really are triangle and, of course, rectangle. Now, we... We can draw rectangles uh, with the built-in functionality of SDL2, of course, but then they don't fit in with the kind of um, structure that, that I've been talking about. It doesn't really uh, solve the problem that really I'm, I want to do. So that's the broad outline of what it is that I want to achieve, and that's the sort of structure of the code that I'm planning to use at the moment. I think the next best thing now really is that we head over to the computer and have a look at the code that I've created. And I want to talk a little bit about the how I've set the project up, the folder structure that I'm using, how I've set up the include files, and I'm going to be using GMake. Um, now I've used GMake before as part of the ray tracing tutorial. If you followed along with that, you will have seen it before. And I want to use GMake to manage the build for this project to keep everything uh, nice and organized and uh, nice and simple. So I suggest we head over to the computer now and uh, let, let's have a look at what I've got so far. The first thing that I just wanted to talk about was the folder structure that, that I'm using. It's not particularly complicated, but what I've done is uh, I've simply created a folder for our code, and here I've got the main.cpp file, which is going to be the main entry point for the, the code, and then we've got capp.cpp and capp.h. We're going to have a look at the code in a moment, um, but capp uh, it carries the basic sort of functionality that actually makes our overall application work. And what I've then done is created a separate folder here that's called qblib2d. And if we go into that and have a look, so inside qblib2d, I now have the, uh, all of the code required for the different classes that we're going to need. So as we've just seen in the uh, structure diagram that I've just showed you, we have object.h and object.cpp. That's our base class. 
then we have circle.h and circle.cpp, which is the first uh, sort of very basic test class that I've created that inherits from the object base class uh, in order to render a circle. We have qb color and qh, qb color.h and qb color.cpp that we've brought over from the ray tracing tutorial. So there'll be links to all of these different episodes and things uh, in the description down below. And then finally, we have qb lib2d.h, which is intended to be one single include file that we can hash include into our code that will bring in all of the uh, other files uh, within the qb lib2d folder. So let's just go back to our uh, sort of root folder for the project and let's have a look at the individual files that we have here and I think really the first thing that I want to talk about is just to have a look at the make file so I mentioned just now I'm, going, I'm using gmake um, to manage the project and that's something that's really quite uh, useful and makes managing a project like this and running the builds much more easy. So if you've been following the uh, fractal tutorials that we've been looking at, where they end up with, say, two or three separate classes, like the QB Turtle class, the QB VK Generator class, and so on, it gets quite cumbersome having to, you know, type out commands like this, you know, main, and then you do main.cpp and say qb turtle.cpp, qb vk generator.cpp, whatever. You end up having to type quite a lot, and it's quite annoying. Uh, using gmake means I can run my code, I can compile my code by simply typing make and pressing enter. So what I want to look at first is the actual structure that I've used for the make file. So this is the uh, structure that I've got for the for the make file. So those of you that have seen the ray tracing tutorial and you know may have followed along with that um, will have seen uh, this kind of thing before, and you know from from me. So this this is not actually that diff different, except that I've I've made some changes to make it a little bit more generic. The first thing that we do is we define our link target, which is called main. So this is the the name of the executable that we want to generate. We then need to specify that we're using uh, some libraries. So we need to define a variable called libs, uh, which we uh, assign the value of minus L SDL2. And that's what will tell the linker that we need to link against the SDL2 libraries. And we need to define some flags. I'm specifically now using the C++17 standard. So we need to define a variable called C flags and we set that to minus SDD equals C++17. We'll see uh, why we need that later. And then the, the interesting part and where I think this is, is quite different is that since I used make files before for the ray tracing tutorial, I now better understand how to use them um, more automatically. So this defines the list of the object files that we need to create from the source code. So first of all, obviously, we have main uh, and we have C app. Uh, so those are the two uh, principal CPP files that we need to compile. But then we need to compile everything that exists within the um, kblib2d uh, folder. And it gets a bit annoying if every time you create a new class uh, that you have to go and manually add that into the list of object files. So what I found that it's possible to do is to use this syntax here. And this will tell gmake to go into that folder. Here you see dot slash kblib2d. Um, slash star.cpp and it will list all of the uh, CPP files in that folder and will automatically then uh, generate the .o files for each of the CPP files as it goes. So what this means is so specifying the wildcard here means that we can use the star.cpp thing and that will evaluate properly and then this um, pattern substitute means that we're substituting uh, wherever we see um, file name.cpp, we substitute that with file name.o to create the necessary object, um, uh, the necessary entry into the object's variable. And then we simply define our rebuildable, so everything that needs to be rebuilt each time is simply the contents of the object's variable and, of course, the contents of link target. And then we have our rules that actually perform the um, the actual compiling. So rule two, this is the one that will actually be executed first for each one, for each entry in the objects variable. And so, but it's a little bit confusing how that works. And I did go over that in the episode where we talked about make files before, but what happens is, so we define for our link target, which is main, we look at every object in our objects variable. Um, so each one of these and each um, each entry that was generated by this and we go through each one in turn and then it will actually call uh, rule two first which takes the dot o 
entry, say, main.o, and, and knows that it has to create that by compiling main.cpp, and it does that using G++, and we set minus O, and then this flag means to specify that we want to use uh, this one, and then minus C is, is the, uh, the code, and then this flag means that we want to use whatever entry we have here, and then we have to pass the flags for the compiler, the compiler flags, because we want to tell it that we are specifically using the C++ 17 standards. And then rule two, that will execute then for every entry in dollar objects in the objects variable. And then it will finally do execute rule one, which runs G++ here just to do basically to do the linking. So it creates the output of link target, which is just simply going to be in this case main, uh, for each of the entries in object and it passed to it the uh, library and the C flags. And then finally we have this here to do cleaning. Uh, I'm going to show what that does in a moment. So let's just have a look at how we go about using that make file. What's really nice about using a make file is rather than having to type out long commands manually with G++, this sort of thing, minus O, main, main.cpp, um, circle.cpp, whatever. Now, now we've got the make file, all we have to do is when I'm in the uh, main folder for the project where the, here where the make file exists, I just have to type make and press enter, and that will go through and that will automatically compile every code. So it starts with main.o and capp.o as we've seen, and then it automatically picks up all of the files in the qblib2d folder and will compile those. And that's all we need to do. And if we just clear that and look back at what we have now, we now see that we have the main uh, executable file. We also have our object file, capp.o, main.o. And if we go into qblib2d and look at that, we now see that we have object files for each of these. So circle.o, object.o, and qbcolor.o, like so. Okay, and I mentioned about the, particularly about the clean method, as you can see here, which is really handy. If you want to clean up, if you want to take away all of your code, you simply have to type make clean, and that automatically deletes all of the object files and the executable, taking us back to our original fresh state, which is, I think, a really nice, a really nice way of working. So let's have a look at some of the specific code that I've used. And first of all, there's uh, main.cpp. Uh, this is really very basic. So this is just the main entry point of our code. We have to include capp.h because we're going to create an instance of the capp class. So the capp class is the code that contains the code that actually makes our application work. And in our main function, all we do is simply declare int main for our entry point, and we create an instance of the capp class, which we call the app. And then we simply call capp. Uh, the app dot on execute, so called the on execute function uh, within that class. And that's it for main.cpp. Okay, so let's have a look at capp.cpp and capp.h. So these haven't really changed uh, since the ones I've been using for the fractal series. And, and like I say, if you go back and look at the episode where I first talked about using the SDL library, you will see exactly the same structure. So nothing, nothing is different here. All we do is we define our class for capp. Uh, well, first of all, we have to hash include, obviously, the SDL library, and we're using array. And we define our class for our C app, which has a public constructor, and then it has uh, functions for on execute, on init, or on initialize, on event for handling events, on loop, on render, on, on exit, um, which I think are fairly self-evident, and then some private variables, simply a boolean to show whether we're running or not, and a pointer to our window and a pointer to our renderer. Those are both from SDL. And then I actually just defined uh, three arrays of red, green, and blue values that correspond to the standard values I use for my channel branding. That's not particularly important, but I just like to keep them in there uh, in case I want to use them. So if we look at capp.cpp, uh, the, the one thing to note here is that we, first of all, hash include um, qblib2d slash qblib2d.h, which is the master header file that I talked about. And actually, now's quite a good time. Let's just have a look at that. All that does is simply hash include everything else from the QB library, from the QB lib2d library. So we have QB color.h, object.h, and circle.h now. So each time I add a new class to this library, I just have to put a hash include entry into the QB lib2d.h file. And then everywhere where I use that, like here in capp.cpp, that means I'll automatically get access uh, to that new class. So the structure of this file I have talked about before in the episode I did on using the SDL library. So I'm not going to talk about that in any great detail. Um, 
this sort of shows how I want the uh, library to be able to work. So I've defined the library in a kubelib 2 d namespace. We'll see about that in a moment. And then so we have the circle class and I want to be able to create an instance of the circle class, which I've called here test circle. And I want to be able to position it at a position on the screen, in this case, 640 by 360, the radius of 100. And then I want to be able to specify its color. And then here I've just written some test code to test that we can uh, extract the relevant uh, parameters of that, the bounding box and the center, and then I test the rendering. And then the rest of this code, as I say, I've talked about this before, this is just the basic on execute, which is the main loop that runs continuously uh, while the program is running. And every time through the loop that polls for events, which is important so you can detect when the user hits the close button. And then we also have on loop and on render, which are functions we could use to make animations and things. So this is basically the structure you could use to create kind of like a basic game loop or something like that. Uh, on event, on loop. The only thing I want to mention about in on render is I put in this um, command here, SDL delay one, which means to impose a delay of one millisecond. And if you don't do that, what will happen is this, this loop here will simply loop through as fast as it can, and it will max out at least probably one of your CPU cores uh, while it's doing that because it simply goes as fast as it can. Imposing a delay of one millisecond doesn't make any perceptible difference to the user, uh, but means that the CPU usage then barely registers, so it makes a massive difference. Okay, and then simply on exit uh, takes care of cleaning up the window. So that's basically it for CAP dot cpp and capp.h as I say those define the class that actually implements the uh, application. What I want to look at next is the base class that I talked about called object. So we have object.h and object.cpp. So this is the header file for the base class for object uh, base class and this exists so all all classes that I'm creating within uh, kubelib2d are going to exist within the kubelib2d namespace. So the first thing we do is declare uh, that everything here exists within a namespace and then within that namespace we create our class for object and we define uh, the, the various public functions that that should have. It should have a constructor, a virtual destructor, which means that we have to override that. We have to create our own instance of that with anything that inherits from this. And then we have functions to set the color and get the color. Now those are going to be common to all um, all of the object classes. So everything that inherits from this class is going to need to set color and get color. So there's no need to create those as virtual because we don't need to override them in our uh, subsequent classes, that in our child classes from this one. So we can just leave those as they are. And then we will need to override our function to get the bounding box because the way that's calculated will depend on the specific shape. And we also need to override a render method. Um, so the point of this is if, if we look back at the code I have in capp.cpp, where we create an instance of our circle, when we actually want to, to draw it, we simply call test circle here and we call the render method uh, on, on test circle, the render function of test circle, and we pass to it our pointer to our renderer, and that will actually initiate the rendering of the circle. And the point is, is that then at some point in the future, we can simply drop that into the on render loop. We can put some code in here to simply loop through every object that we need to draw, and we simply need to call the render method of each one and it will get it will take care of the the drawing as i mentioned at the beginning really what we're going for is a way of abstracting away as much as possible of the the drawing um, process that we can okay so that's everything we have one private uh, method that will be common to all shapes all 2d primitives of course which is their color one private property Okay, so object.cpp, this doesn't actually really need to contain any code particularly because it's simply designed to be inherited. So, so we design just a blank constructor and a blank destructor and then really just filler code for set color and get color. Well, actually, this is not filler code. The, these really do their function. These are not going to be overridden at all. So all these simply do is store the color and return the color as necessary. Notice that we're using the QB color class that we uh, developed back in the ray tracing tutorial. There'll be links to those relevant episodes in the description below. And then finally, we have our defini initial definitions for uh, get bounds, which returns a variable of type SDL rect, rectangle definition and uh, render, which simply returns true. So that is everything that we have then for the base class object.h and object.cpp. And let's have a look now at a specific um, class that inherits from that. And for now, what I've managed to achieve so far is to create a very basic implementation of a circle. 
um, that we'll see in a moment. But this really sort of shows my thinking and how I'm, I'm thinking um, that this is all going to go. So again, this is defined in the qblib2d namespace. And then we create an instance, or we create a definition, sorry, a definition of the class circle that inherits um, from the object class. And then we have to override some of our, our functions. So we create our own uh, unique constructor that accepts as input a SDL point structure representing the point, the coordinates of the center of the circle, it takes an integer for the radius and uh, a QB color object representing the color. And then we override the destructor, uh, we override the get bounds uh, function, we override the render function. And then we have our specific functions here that are specific to this shape, which are get center and get radius. Um, those are not necessarily going to be the same for every shape. So those are defined specifically within this class rather than in the object base class. And then we have a private function to compute the bounds. So whenever any of these parameters are set or altered, we need to recalculate the bounds. And then we have our private uh, member variables uh, to store our bounds, to store the center coordinates, to store the color and to store the radius. OK, and that is circle.h. In circle.cpp, um, what I've done, this is where using the C17 standard comes in. So I've hash included algorithm, which brings in the uh, standard algorithms from the standard library. Uh, our constructor, as I mentioned, so it's defined this way as qblib2d because it belongs to the qblib2d namespace, colon, colon, circle because it's in the circle class, colon, colon, circle because it's the constructor. And that accepts as input a point representing our center, an integer for a radius, and a QB color object for the color. And then we simply store those and then call the internal compute bounds function to calculate the bounding box. The destructor, we don't need to do anything with that for now. And so get bounds simply then returns m bounds. That's really easy. And this is the interesting bit. This is the code that actually does the rendering. So this is the, the render method. So my plan, because the, the base class requires that every uh, class inheriting from it implement a render method this will be a standard interface to all objects so they will all have this render method that will take care of rendering whatever that shape happens to be so the first thing that we do is extract the color as rgb integers and then we use the sdl set render draw color to uh, set the color to that passing the pointer to our renderer and of course before we do anything we obviously check that the renderer is valid so we check if it's not a null pointer then we can do stuff um, if it is a null pointer, then we can't, so there's no point trying to do anything. And then to actually draw the circle, initially I'm using the very simplest possible algorithm. And this is generally my approach to coding, that whenever I'm faced with a particular problem, I try to write the very simplest code that might work first. And then I like to iteratively increase the complexity or if the efficiency of the alg algorithm or whatever uh, until I get the sort of desired uh, balance between algorithmic efficiency and uh, simplicity of the code so but we'll see we'll see about that in a moment so the first thing we do is simply extract the coordinates of the bounding square and the circle center so I this is something I do because these variable names here are quite descriptive they're also quite long and I find them a little bit cumbersome sometimes to work with in the, the code locally so I like to create local uh, variables that contain a copy of those that's just my personal preference and once you've extracted those, we need to clamp them to ensure that they fit within the supplied renderer. So this is essentially then going to implement clipping. Um, so we, we extract our renderer width and our renderer height, and then we're using the clamp algorithm from the standard library. So this is the C17 bit, and we simply clamp each one of those to be between zero and render width or render height uh, uh, accordingly. And then all we need to do to actually draw the circle is simply loop over all of the points in whatever is left here. So start x to end x and start y to end y. It's what s and e mean, okay? So we loop from x through start x to end x and y through start y to end y. And then for every pixel, we calculate uh, the result of this equation. This is the very basic circle equation. It's really that simple. This is just x minus the center x squared uh, plus y minus center y squared minus the radius squared Okay, and the equation of a circle is simply that set equal to zero, but that gives obviously just the outline edge. So what we need to test is if circle V is less than or equal to zero, then we know that we're inside our circle. If it's greater than zero, then we know that we're outside the circle. So all we test is if circle V is less than or equal to zero, then we use STL render draw point to render our pixel, to draw our pixel into the renderer, and that's it. 
And like I said, this is the very, the, the most basic algorithm for drawing a circle that there is. I know that there are ways of doing it that are much faster than this, utilizing the, the inherent symmetry of a circle shape. And over the next week, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at making this uh, more efficient and stuff. And then we'll talk about that. I will, I will talk about that in, in the next episode. So we'll see um, how to do that. It is possible to reduce. Um, actually, I think, as I understand it, it's only necessary to really test 12.5% of the pixels within the, the bounding box of the circle in order to actually create the circle shape which obviously leads to a significant improvement in performance so but as i say that's something i'm going to look at over the next week and then we can discuss that in the next episode and then that simply returns true if it was successful and returns false if uh, if for some reason our renderer wasn't valid and then we simply have the functions to return the parameters so a function to get center and get radius those are pretty basic and our function to compute the bounds all this simply does is um, because we're storing the bounds in an SDL rect structure, uh, we calculate the position of the left and the top, of the left handmost edge and the top edge um, accordingly, and then the width and the height of the bounding box, and we store those. Actually, is everything. That's that's really the code that's that I've implemented so far. The other class that we have in the library now is. Um, the QB color class, but I've talked about that before in the episodes back in the ray tracing tutorial, so I'm not going to touch on that now. The only modification I made was to bring it into the, uh, the relevant namespace, and, and that's simply done in the header file using this kind of uh, declaration here. Okay, so let's just have a look at just quickly how this code uh, functions. Okay, so if we go back to our terminal window and we can just run make just to make sure we compile everything. Let's just let that run through. Okay, and then if I run the code simply like that, and there we are. And as you can see, it renders uh, exactly as we expected a red circle in the center of our window, which is not tremendously exciting, but what it does mean is that uh, our library is working. We've um, sort of what, what, what I've achieved really predominantly over the last week is to come up with a, a structure uh, of the code and things that I think is quite uh, quite pleasing and uh, develop the make file that allows makes it easy to, to render our code and I've implemented so far the most basic possible algorithm for rendering a circle and as I say we're going over the next week I'm going to work on improving that and then we can talk about that more in the next episode and also have a look at how we would implement uh, the other shapes that I've talked about. So that's really what we have so far. So uh, there we go. That's really everything that I wanted to talk about today. Uh, as I said at the beginning, it is a little bit of a different format to what we've done before. Um, going a bit more for a devlog thing, because as you've seen, this is something I'm still in the process of working on. And I think it's interesting and hopefully instructive and inspiring to people um, out there that to sort of see what I'm doing. If you have any comments on my approach or how I'm going about doing this, please let me know in the comments below. I'm not uh, <laughs> I'm not really going to sit here and say that the way I'm doing things is necessarily the best way or the most optimum way. It is just the way that I feel that I like to solve this problem and creates a structure of code that I think works for sort of me and what I have in my mind, what I want to go on to do with it next. But like I say, please, you know, let me know in the comments below what you think. It'd be great to hear from you, maybe have some kind of dialogue. Uh, about if you have different ideas about how this kind of thing can be done, I'd be very interested to hear them. Okay, so, I mean, there we go. That's it for today. Um, I, I hope you've enjoyed the video. I hope uh, at least some of you out there have found it useful. Uh, if you've liked the video, please remember to hit that like button. And if you haven't done so already, please remember to subscribe to my channel so that you don't have to miss any future videos. Listen, it's been a pleasure. I really look forward to seeing you in the next video next week when I'm going to talk about making the circle algorithm a lot more efficient and also talk about how you know we can implement the code to uh, create uh, different shapes. So at least a filled polygon and hopefully thick lines or lines with variable thickness as well. Uh, so we'll see. But anyway, it's like I say, it's, it's been a pleasure. I really look forward to seeing you in the next episode and Thank you very much for watching. Bye.